at your introduction page where it says at the top, God is God and there is none other. Okay? So we're going to read a few verses here. As I look around the room, as far as I know, everyone in here is a Christian, so I don't have to prove to you that there is a God. Okay? So I don't want to waste time doing that. I don't want to waste time uh, proving to you that this is the Word of God. Although, in two or three of these pages, we do have a whole lot of notes about that. So these notes are for your study, as you should know by now. I don't go by the notes. I continually get off and run around the room. So what you need to do is read these notes, because the, all the chapter and verses are in these notes to back up the things that I, I'm about to teach you. So you see, God is God, and there is none other. God is omnipotent. That means he's all-powerful. Okay? He's omniscient. That means he's all-knowing. And he's on the present, that means present always. Those are three of the attributes of God. There's many, many attributes, but these three attributes really kill a lot of the teaching that goes on in the world today. For instance, people say that God tries men and tests men to see what man will do. If God is omniscient, he already knows what man's going to do. Okay? But I know that there's teaching going around that says, well, God just put you through that just to see what you would do. And sometimes he puts men through things to see what they're going to do. And then he does what he wants to do. No, God's going to do what he wants to do no matter what man does. God is all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He's always present. He already knows what you're going to do today, tomorrow, next year. You know, God knows everything. So he doesn't have to try you to see what you're made of. He tries you so you can see what you're made of. So you can see that your needs, your weaknesses, so that you can see how close, how you need to get closer to Him. I mean, God tries you, and not only to do that, but to make you stronger for the next trial. Because He's preparing you. God is preparing each and every one of us to fulfill the course that He has given us to do. He's given you gifts and talents. God has something for everyone to do. So He's omnipotent, He's omniscient, He's omnipresent. He's unsearchable. You know, it always kills me when somebody says, I found God. I didn't know he was lost. God's not lost. Man is lost. And, and people can search and search and search all they want to, but the Bible says that God is unsearchable. Why? Because his thoughts are so far beyond our thoughts. His ways are so far beyond our ways. He's, he's infinite. That means he's without measure. And he has no beginning and no end. He, you can't measure God. Where man is finite. We have to have a beginning. We have to have an end. And we can only take so much. <laughs> okay? But he knows our limit. He knows our limit. So, but God is unsearchable. He's immutable. He does not change. And I've heard people say, oh yes, God does change. No, God does not change. The Bible tells us very clearly in these verses that God does not change. Now, he may change the way that he's working with an individual or even a nation based upon something that he had already predetermined before the world was even laid. You know, there's so many things that he did and he, and he planned out before the very foundation of the world. So we need to learn that a lot of the things that we've learned, we need to put them aside. We really do. And we need to come to the Word of God fresh and seek the Holy Spirit and have Him to guide us and direct us as we learn the Word of God, as we study the Word of God. We need to learn how to rightly divide it. We're going to look at a lot of those things. The Bible says that He's invisible. It says, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. There are manifestations of God. In the, in the Old Testament, we have the angel of the Lord that appeared unto man. And that was the pre-incarnate Christ. We have him appear as the angel of the Lord. We have Jesus in the New Testament, who, who was an image. I mean, actually, Jesus Christ is God. He's God, he's God the Son. And he is, he is an image of the invisible God. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen God. <laughs> he is God. All right? Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 says, God, who at some dry times, that means different times, and in diverse manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. He hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things 
by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, that's not, that's not the Lord's throne. That's God the Father's throne. Jesus has yet to sit in his throne, but he will. Because his throne will be here in Jerusalem, in the new temple. That's not the one that's going to be built next, but the following one. The one that he's going to build. That is his throne here upon this earth. When, he said, when they said, how do we pray? He said, pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth. That kingdom is coming to the earth. It is not here yet, and we haven't missed it. <laughs> it is coming. And when it comes, the kingdom of heaven will be here on the earth, and that is where his throne is. And he will sit on that throne for that whole thousand years. So a lot of things that we have been taught, and even things that I taught myself, after I got into studying God's word, I said, wow, that's not in the word of God. You know, I, for instance, I shared with him Sunday that I was always taught that the high priest had a big rope on his foot and if he went into the Holy of Holies and did anything wrong, he'd die and they'd pull him out. That's not true. That's not true. He never had a rope on his foot in the Holy of Holies. And, and he didn't have bells. They said he had bells on when he went into the Holy of Holies. And that the, as long as the bells kept ringing, as you can see his costume here with the bells, as long as the bells kept ringing, he was okay and he'd done everything right. But if the bells quit ringing, they knew he'd die and he'd pull him out. That is not true. That is not in the Bible. Because he doesn't wear the bells when he goes into the Holy of Holies. He only wears the white linen garment. That's all he wears when he goes in because he represents the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So a lot of things we've been taught we need to lay aside and we need to open up our Bible. When I started reading that, I said, wait a minute. There was no rope on his... Wait a minute. He took off his kingly outfit. That's his kingly outfit with the bells and, and, the, and the stones and the gold. When he went into the Holy of Holies, he went in in a white linen garment, and that's it. Nothing else. And it was totally spotted with blood. Because when he'd go in and sprinkle the blood, it went all over him. He had to change five times and change and wash up ten times. He had to wash his hands and his face and so He was covered with blood. So a lot of the things that we have taught and that has been taught to us are not in your Bible. We need to study our Bible. I mean, when you think about it, when Jesus comes back in Revelation 19, when he comes back, it says that he's riding that white horse and there's blood on his garment. How did he have blood on his garment? Because he went into heaven and sprinkled his blood, just like the high priest in the Old Testament. Now you're, you're looking at me, wow, really? Really? Wait until you see how this lays out in your Bible. So we've been taught a lot of things that really are not in the Bible. It's just something that someone made up. We need to stick to this book. We need to take it literally. That it says what it means. I mean, why would God give us a book and tell you just interpret it any way that you feel? It kind of makes you think of some of these stupid movies that they make now. And at the end of the movie, they tell you, now get on your computer and decide which way you want it to end. And then send it in. Have you, have you ever heard of that? Yeah. <laughs> and so you can pick the way the movie ends. And if you don't like the way that it ends, you can vote, and they change it, and, and you see it a different way. And books now, I've seen books do that too. A lot of times an author will write a book, and at the end of the book, he'll have two last chapters. You pick which one you like. And isn't that what the world is saying about God? You pick what you like. Whatever makes you feel good. Okay? It's, it's, the world wants that. And, and so we need to really get into the Bible. Let me read these scriptures that's in the box, because it shows us that God is all-powerful, all-knowing, and on the present. It says, O Lord... Thou hast searched me and known me. He knows you. <laughs> There's nothing about you he don't know. Thou knowest my down sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought from afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O oh Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Can you imagine? 
Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thine hand upon me such knowledge as too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain unto it. Whether, whether shall I go, or whither shall I go? I love the King James. Whither shall I go? Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, there you are. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. It, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the up, up, uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. I remember telling the teenagers that no matter where you are, how dark it is, God sees you like there's a hundred watt bulb all the way around you. Because he doesn't see the darkness. No matter how dark it is, he sees the light. Okay? The darkness and the light are both light to him. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. But we have limits. Okay? God doesn't. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written. That means that God knew what you were going to do even before you were born. He knew what you were going to do your whole life. You don't surprise God. Okay? You don't surprise God. God knows it all. When as yet there was none of them, how precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God, how great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. So God knows it all, and he's omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. He sees it all, he knows it all, and he's all-powerful. Look at the next page. God magnified his word above all his name. Can you imagine? Above all God's name, he magnified his word. And people dare take away from it or add to it. Right. They dare saying that God has given them a word of knowledge and it's a new revelation. When God put an amen to the last chapter, he meant amen. <laughs> That's it. And he tells us in the last chapter, don't add to it, don't take away from it, because if you do, all the plagues of this book will be added unto you. God finished the word, and he said, Amen. Since man is finite and God is infinite, God had to reveal himself unto man. Now that's what this is all about. Okay? <coughs> you know, it was always in the heart of God to create man. There's an eternal God the Father eternal God the Son, eternal God the Holy Spirit, and the eternal purpose of God. There was never a day when God just went, oh, I think I'll create man. It was always in his heart to create man. He's eternal. Now why would he create man? He created man to love. Because the Bible says God is love. He created man to bring him glory. He created man to, to love him back. I mean, God had a purpose to create man, and he created man in his image so man would have a will to choose because God wanted him to choose him. And to choose him, there had to be a choice. We talked about that all last Bible study was the devil. Why didn't God destroy the devil? Because the devil would be used to test man, to give man that opportunity. Because see, man, every man and woman is going to stand before God without excuse. Romans chapter 1 tells us that. Man will stand before God without excuse. And God has revealed himself unto man where man is totally without excuse. And the first way that he reveals himself unto man is the natural. You know, man can look into the creation and look into the beautiful skies at night and, and look at that beautiful baby. I mean, God, God has put it in man's heart to say, Wow, there is a God. And they may worship him as all different kinds of strange names, but they know that there is a power greater than them, that there is a God. And, but how do we teach, you know, how would God teach man that I am God, not the alligator, not the rock, not all those 
other things, I am God. This is how he would teach that he was God and how to get to God. This is the supernatural revelation of God, right? Would be the word. Because without it, you might believe that there's a God, but you would ask, how do I get to God? How do I know God? God wants man to know him. He wants man to know his will. He wants man to know how to come to him. He has given us this word, and we are to study this word. And the more you study it, the more you know God. I used to hear an old preacher who used to say, little knowledge, little faith, big knowledge, big faith. Because the more you know of God, the more you love him. And the more you want to know of him. So he gave us the word of God. So we have the natural, that yes, there is a God. We have the supernatural. Here he is. This is his will. This is his plan. This is his purpose. This is how to get to him. It's all right here in this book. And that's why he said, I have magnified my word above all my name. And, and who is the Word? Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word. <laughs> and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But if you go on down to verse 14, what does it say? And the Word became flesh. So Jesus is the living Word, and this is the written Word. And what is it to reveal? God to man. That's why he says he's unsearchable. You can sit out in the desert for years and years and years and look up into the sky. And say, yes, there is a God. Yes, there is a God. How do I get to know him? This is how. This is his purpose. This is his plan. So he knew that man could not know him if he didn't reveal himself. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Job 36, 25 says, Every man may see it, man may behold it afar off. Behold, God is great, and we know him not, neither can the number of his years be searched out. He reveals himself. He reveals his plan. In eternity past, it was always his purpose that he would create man in his image, and that man would be tested that's why he gave him the will. Because if you think about it, and we've studied this before, if you think about it, love is a choice. And God wants you to choose him because of love. My mom used to say, if you don't listen, you're going to feel. <laughs> okay? And, uh, what she, and we all know what she meant by that. You know, God kind of says that. <laughs> if you don't listen, you're going to feel. Today is the uh, is one year. that my, It was one year ago today that my mom went to heaven. And uh, I'm sure she's up there just praising the Lord, having a wonderful time. Her favorite flower was the yellow rose. I missed her a lot this week as I was making the notebooks and things because she always did all that. <laughs> she was the one who fussed around, gave everybody the papers and the notes and kept everything in order. Yeah. You know, so I'm a little disordered <laughs> because she did all that. And I just, and you know, as much as I miss her, I wouldn't bring her back here for anything. I just want to go be with her. And that trumpet makes it. <laughs> and it makes down tonight. God magnified his word above his name, all his name. He loved man. He wanted, he wanted to love man. And he wants man to love him. He said, I'm going to create man. I'm going to create time. He said, I have a purpose. He has a plan. You know, anybody who has a purpose needs a plan. And here's the plan. Here's the plan right here. He said, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. It's of no private interpretation. It's just you read it and you take it literally. This is what the Bible says. Why would he make it confusing where everybody had to sit around and say, well, what do you think it means? And what do you think it means? It means what it says. And it's very simple. He gives us everything in, in, in plan. He has a plan for everything and give it, give it to us in order. If we just stop and think about it for just a minute. Now, I am going to get away from these notes. I'm sorry. You're just going to have to read your notes. Okay. 
in eternity past. Here we have eternity past. God is eternal. He has no beginning, no end. So in eternity past, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So we're going to create man. But to create man, since he is only finite, there has to be a certain amount of time, a time limit. Because eternity has no beginning and no end. you got eternity past, you got eternity future. And his purpose was in eternity past, that he was going to create man. So he cuts out a little bit of eternity. If you could just think about that for a minute. Here's eternity. Just continues going on and on and on. He said, we're going to have to cut out a little bit of eternity, 7,000 years. And we're going to call this little piece of eternity that we cut out time. And it's just for man. Because there's no time in heaven. <laughs> There'll be no time in eternity future, praise the Lord, no alarm clocks. No schedules that you have to run and hurry and do this and hurry to do that. There'll be no time. There was no time in the past, and there'll be no time in eternity future. Time was just for man. To test man. To teach man that there is a God who loves him. And a God that, that wants him to know him and to love him. To know his plan, to know his will. And that's why he gave the word. So he, he created man. He, well, at first he created time. He's going to have to cut out a certain amount of, time, of, uh, of eternity and call it time, and it would be 7,000 years. Now, why do we say 7,000 years? Because there's only 7,000 years recorded in this book. 4,000 years from Adam to Christ. 2,000 years from Christ till now, and then there's a 1,000-year kingdom still promised. How many is that? That's 7,000 years recorded in this book. We don't know anything in eternity past. If he wanted us to know it, it would be in this book. <laughs> and listen, we don't know anything in eternity future. Right. If he wanted us to know that, he'd have put it in this book. <laughs> All we do know is it's going to be a new heaven and new earth and no sin and no devil <laughs> and no sorrow and no pain. We do know those things because those are eternal promises. So in eternity past, he said we're going to create man. We're going to cut out a certain amount of time where there would be a beginning and an end. And we're going to call it time. It'd be 7,000 years. And when he did that, after that was part of his plan and part of his purpose, he said, all right, then we're going to create the earth. Now, before he created the earth, what did he create first? The angels. Now, those of you who sat in class last year, this is, new, this is not new for you. So he created the angels first. Why did he create the angels? They would be ministering spirits to help him. Not that he needed any help, but to help him, to assist him. But they would be ministering spirits unto you, his children. Hebrews tells us that each and every one of us have guardian angels. And he created them before he created the earth. And so what does that mean? Bob. He created guardian angels for you before you were even born. Before Adam and Eve were even created. He created angels for you. Now how do we know that he created angels first? Because they shouted for joy. In Job chapter 38, the Bible says that the angels shouted for joy when he laid the foundations of the earth. By the way, all those, it's all in your book here. <laughs> and it's all in your notes. I'm giving you all these scriptures. The angel shouted for joy because when he laid the foundation of the earth, it was so beautiful. But the Bible tells us that he created it to be inhabited. Isaiah chapter 45 verse 18 says he did not create the earth without form and void. Okay? Now we've studied this before and it's in your notes. He did not create the earth void and empty. When he created the earth, it was created absolutely beautiful. Anything ugly, anything without form, anything that's void and empty and dark and covered with darkness, that's not what God created. That came about because of sin. Okay? It came about because of sin. When he created the heavens, when he created the earth, remember there's three heavens. 
When he created the heavens and he created the earth, it was absolutely perfect. It was beautiful. And the angels shouted for joy. You find that in Job chapter 38. And by the way, the Feast of Trumpets, the Jews celebrated as being the birthday of Adam and Eve. Because they look at this as the first day of creation. We're going to get into all of that as we go on through our lessons. You know, I was thinking today, we've got 12 lessons. And I thought, wow, that's two hours a lesson. That's 24 hours. Can we give one day to God? Stretched out in 12 weeks. One day to God, 24 hours. It seems like a long time, 12 weeks, but when you think about it, it's only one day as we study and we give one day to God. He created the heavens and the earth, and he created the absolutely perfect. It was beautiful, and the angels shouted for joy. And he had three different types of angels that we studied last year. He had the seraphim, and they were the red angels with the six wings, and they represented fire and judgment and justice. And he created the cherubims, and they were guardian angels, and he created the messenger angels, three different types of angels. And he names three angels in the Bible. He named Michael, he named Gabriel, and he named Lucifer. And as we studied this last year, so I'm just going to breeze through it. Lucifer was the wisest and most beautiful of all God's creations. But don't you stop and think about this for just a minute. Lucifer saw him create the heavens and the earth. And he spoke them into existence. God spoke them into existence. How do we know? Because the Old Testament is written in Hebrew and the New Testament is written in Greek. The Hebrew words, every word has a meaning. And the word create means bara. And that means to speak into existence out of nothing. He just spoke it all into existence. And that word create is only used three times in the beginning. And when it's used, it's used to create the heavens and earth in chapter 1, verse 1. It's used when he creates animal life, and it's used when he creates man. Now, you've studied this yourself. You've got all the notes right there. He used it to create man. Three times the word create is used in chapter 1 and 2. Isn't it interesting? He only gives us two chapters for the creation and gives us 50 for the tabernacle. That's something to think about. He gives us 50 for the tabernacle. There's really something he wants us to know about these stars and about this tabernacle. Lord willing, if we're not raptured tonight, we're going to get into that. <laughs> he said, I created the heavens and the earth, and I created them perfect. And guess who we put down here upon the earth first? Lucifer and his angels. They had dominion. Lucifer was the head honcho. He was the most beautiful, the wisest, and he was put in a position of power. Isaiah chapter 14. Ezekiel chapter 28 tells us they describe him how beautiful he was and how wise he was and it tells us that he was he was the he had an ordained position of power and authority. It wasn't enough for him. Pride got to it. Pride got to it. And he wanted to be God. He wanted to be and he said, well, why didn't God just kill him? Because God has a purpose in all that he allows and all that he does. He has a purpose, and we can tie it all together from Genesis to Revelation, as we'll see here in a minute. God had a purpose not destroying Lucifer. Now, Lucifer knows his day is coming because God created hell. And the Bible says he created hell, Matthew chapter 25. He created hell for the devil and his angels, not man. <laughs> not man. But Isaiah chapter 5 tells us that he had to spread hell out. Why? Because so many people reject Jesus Christ. Hell is full of people who believe in God. Even people who believe in Jesus, but people who have not been saved. Hell is full of religious people. So he created hell and he created it for the devil and his angels. And Satan knows he's going to hell. Satan knows the calendar. <laughs> Satan knows the times. Satan knows the seasons. Here's the food for thought. I'm just introducing this tonight. We'll, we'll teach it in the next few weeks. Here's food for thought. What kind of calendar do you use? You use a Roman calendar. 
You're living under Roman time, Bob. Not Bible time. You're, you're under Gregorian calendar. That's a Roman calendar, not God's calendar. The Bible's written in God's calendar. Every day began at 6 o'clock the night before and ended 6 o'clock the day after. This Bible was written in God's time, under God's calendar. We are all confused. We are living under a Roman calendar created by man. Isn't that food for thought? Think about it. Every month is named after a Roman god. Did you know that? Every day of the week is named after a Roman god. Did you know that? Up until the year 300, in the year 300, is when they started changing everything. Started changing the calendar and changing the times. Why? Because Satan was in charge of all that babble. Satan was in charge of all that confusion. He did not want man to know where we are. He did not want man to know God's time. He wants man to know man's time. And we're going to put that all together. But I want you to think about that in the next couple of weeks. We're not living under God's time. Our calendar is a Roman calendar. Our time is Roman time, not God's time. Our months are Roman months. Our seasons are Roman. Everything is Roman, and it's all based upon idolatry that started at the Tower of Babel. That's where it all came from. And it's in this book, just as clear as day, but man said, oh no, we've lived under this calendar all these years. But then they'll look at the Bible and say, there's a contradiction. Something wrong. It's not contradiction in here. No, it's just that people don't realize the times that we're living in is not God's time. It's not. Let's go back. Lucifer was so proud, and the Bible says that he was proud because of his beauty and his proud, proud because of his wisdom and his power. And he led the music. Music came from inside him out. It's like he led the heavenly choir. He had an ordained position of great authority. He is lesser light. Lucifer means lesser light. And the Bible says that he wanted to be God. He said, I will ascend into the heaven. Now, to ascend into the heaven, where does he have to be? Down. If he was in heaven, he wouldn't have said, I'm going to ascend into heaven. He was down here on the beautiful earth. And he said, I'm going to ascend into heaven. And then he had to go up. And he took one-third of the angels with him. Revelation chapter 12 tells us that one-third of the angels followed him. That's where the demons came from. That's where the evil spirits came from. They followed him. They rebelled against God. Revelation chapter 12 shows us two times Satan being cast down out of the heavens. The first time was before man. The second time is right in the middle of the seven-year tribulation. After we're in heaven, we're going to watch him being cast out the next time. Because right now, he goes into heaven. He can only be one place at one time, Bernie. People sometimes give, us, give him more power than what he has, and other times people ignore him like he doesn't even exist. And both of, both of those things are strategies that he uses to keep people confused and in the darkness, because he does not want them to know. You know, as God has been working this whole 6,000 years, so has Satan, to keep people confused. I mean, you think about it. God gave them a message in the stars. And Satan said, well, we can't have that. We're going to have to corrupt it. And he created astrology. How many people actually know the names in the stars that are recorded in this book and what those names mean? How many people actually know that he created the stars and he encircled them around the sun to tell the whole story of the sun, S-O-N. That's what he did. It's a witness. But how, why do we know that? Because we're afraid to study. Why? Because we're told that's of the devil. Astrology is of the devil. The stars are of God. And the Bible tells us that he created them, he numbered them, and he calls them all by their names. Why would God name the stars? <laughs> Why? And isn't it interesting that in every culture, and in all times, the stars have the same names? No matter what language, God named the stars. 
But the devil had to corrupt the message, the true message that's in the stars, because he couldn't destroy it. That's another strategy. What he cannot destroy, Sonny, he corrupts to where people go, wow, that's just too difficult to study. Well, that's, that's scary. I'm not getting into that. Why? Because they won't dig and find those beautiful gems like the Bereans. I love that because they were studying and reading the Word of God to see if the things that was being told to them was true. But see, we'll go to church and we'll sit and we'll listen to somebody who's not telling us the truth. And since they're in that position, we'll go, well, that must be the truth. And it's not. And it's probably something that they've been taught by someone who taught them that, who taught them that. You know the story about the Christmas ham. <laughs> I love that story because it's so true. Because the daughter was making Christmas ham and she cut the end off the ham. And after watching her do this over and over again, her husband said, why do you do that? Because mom always did. <laughs> well, why did she do it? Well, I don't know. Let's call her. And they called and asked, why do you do that? Because my mom always did. Why did grandma do it? Let's call her. Call grandma. Why did you always do that? Because my pain was too short. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you think about it. It's been passed down and passed down and passed down. And without checking it out, people mm -hmm. just go, oh, yes, and let's pass it on, and let's pass it on, and let's pass it on. And then you find out, wow, that's really stupid. <laughs> you don't take just what someone tells you. I spent more time unlearning the things that I had been learned, mm -hmm. <laughs> the things that I had been taught. Why? Because the one in this book. It was just something that somebody had told them. We need to stay in this book. And we find out in Isaiah and then Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, this is all in your notes. We find out in Revelation chapter 12 that Satan took that one third of the angels and he attacked heaven and God cast him down to the earth. Why did he cast him down to the earth? Because he had come from there. He had had dominion here. They celebrated the beauty of all God's creation. And when God cast him down to the earth, what happened? The earth became dark and covered with water. And it just laid there in waste. The earth became that way. Why? Because of the divine judgment of God upon sin. Well, man wasn't even created in Genesis chapter 1. Where did the sin come from? It came from the angels, it came from Satan. God changed his name from Lucifer to Satan, which means adversary, to devil, the accuser. And evil was born. Bash. Evil was born. Now, how long did the earth lay like that? I don't know. Thank you. I don't know how long it laid that way. And guess what? Nobody else does either. <laughs> <laughs> we don't. And you know you'll have these scientific geniuses who will tell you there was this age, and this age, and this age, and this age, so the Bible can't be true. Wait a minute. We don't know how many ages they were, and who cares? Right. Could there have been an ice age? Yeah. Why? Because Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, says that the Spirit brooded upon the face of the waters. Maybe they were frozen. Who cares? Right. Who cares? All we need to know is what God said in this book. Amen. And if there was all those ages, who cares? <laughs> the time period that we have is this. Documented time period is from Adam. Why? Because God set time for Adam. <laughs> it was from Adam when he was created. And they count back the years from all those birthdays. We're going to look at that next week. All those birthdays count back that Adam was created 4,000 years before Jesus. Wow, how simple is that? Mm -hmm. Right? And, and the Bible tells us there's 7,000 years recorded in this book. And he tells us to rightly divide it. But we need to learn how to rightly divide it. We need to. So how long did it lay like that? We don't know. But we know the Holy Spirit rooted upon the face of the waters. And then he said, let there be light. There's your first picture of salvation. Something perfect that was marred by sin. Divine judgment came. Then the Holy Spirit said, let there be light and renew that person. 
So for the next seven days, the Bible said God sent forth His Spirit and renewed the face of the earth. It was already there. He renewed it. Now how do we know that? Well, you've got to study your Hebrew and your Greek. You don't have to pull it out of the air. You know, we lose so much in the English translation of the Hebrew and Greek. If you're going to study God's Word, you need to get a really good Strong's Concordance. And you need to get an Unger's Bible Dictionary. No, I've got books galore. You, we, we wouldn't leave my library. You know what books I use? This one? <laughs> the Unger's Dictionary and the Strong's Concordance. That's what I use. We, you need that because it tells you the meaning of the Hebrew words and the meaning of the Greek words. And you know, you'll follow in your Bible, there'll be little words that's in italics. They're different print from the other words. Do you know that those words weren't in the original? That meant that man added those words. Did you ever read the front page of your Bible? It says any words that's in italics were added by man. All of them. King James, all of them. Why? Because man thought... It would help us to understand it better. So whenever you see a word, a verse that has a little word in it that's in the italics, it means that man added that word to help us to understand that verse. <laughs> a lot of things we need to know. The Hebrew tells us that he created, he used the word vera, but then the next few days, he uses the word asher. I hope you're not looking for that, Ken. It's in there. But... Asher. What does Asher mean? It means uncover it. <laughs> let it appear. It doesn't mean create it. It means to uncover it and let it appear. Why? Because it's covered with water. Two floods. The one with Lucifer. The one with Noah. But he said, don't worry about it. There'll be no more floods. Next time I'm going to burn it up. <laughs> That's what he says. The third time he said... Burn it up and get rid of all the sin. Three, God has special numbers. Special numbers. So then God let the land appear. Then he divided the waters. And then he divided the waters so the seeds would appear. I mean, and how long did it take him to do that? Exactly seven days. 24-hour periods. Not a thousand years each day. Because think about it. A thousand years, say he, un he uncovered the seeds. And then it was a thousand years before he let the sun shine on. <laughs> right. Common sense. <laughs> Besides that, the word day is the word yom, Y-O-M. And if you look in your Hebrew, it means 24 hours. How simple. Hmm. How simple. Why can't we just take it literally for what it says? Because it's a lot easier to understand if we take it the way he wrote it. So what happens? He created man. And he starts that time. He said, okay, this starts the 7,000 years. This starts your 4,000 years before Christ, because he had already been settled in heaven <coughs> before that he laid the foundation of the earth that Jesus Christ was going to come to earth and die for man. It had already been settled. I mean, the whole plan, the eternal purpose and the plan to to get there. <laughs> you know, man needs to learn that, especially once in Washington. If you have a plan, if you have a purpose, you have an objective. This is what I want to accomplish. And then you have a plan to get there. Right? right? Yeah. Why is that so hard to understand? God had a purpose. He had a plan. He sat down with, with God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The whole plan was totally mapped out before the foundation of the earth was even laid. The Bible says Jesus Christ died before the foundation of the earth was even laid. Does it mean that he died then? No, it means that it's so sure that he's going to die. It's as if he already did. It was finished. It was finished. God had a plan. But how to reveal that to man? How, how to reveal that to man? God started revealing it to him. I mean, the first picture of salvation is Genesis chapter 1. Then what's, where's the next picture of salvation? When Eve was deceived and her and Adam sinned, what did, what did the Lord do? They covered themselves and they hid. They had never hidden before. 
They were ashamed. They were afraid. Why? Because now they were guilty. They were guilty and they knew they were guilty. But we see a picture of salvation there. But let's back up and see what God did. God created Adam. Then he created Eve. Now what he did with Adam was he put him to sleep and he took a rib from his side and he made Eve. Notice he made Eve. <laughs> he made man. <laughs> he made Eve out of man's side because man needed a help meet. And it was a woman. A woman had a man. <laughs> and he needed a help meet. So he created Eve to be his help mate. And he ordained marriage. One man, one woman. And he created this beautiful garden and he put him in the garden and he told Adam, you keep the garden and you till the garden. Two different words. Till meant what we do in the garden. Keep it meant to protect it from the outside. What did he need to protect it from the outside? Satan and evil. Because see, they were innocent. Adam and Eve were innocent till they sinned. And that's where we get to God's program. God said in those 7,000 years, there's going to be seven different time periods. And the Bible calls them dispensations. This is simple. This is very simple. We have seven different dispensations or time periods. He created them in innocence. And they were in a garden innocent. They didn't even know they were naked. They were innocent. It's just like a little baby pulled diaper off and run right through town. <laughs> no shame at all. Why? Because it was innocent. It was innocent. Adam and Eve were innocent. He had created Adam in his own image. He had created Eve that way. They had a will. They were a spirit with a soul living in a body. That's what you are, Ken. You're a spirit. Right? <laughs> you have a soul, which is the seat of emotions. That's where your will is. And then you have, it's being carried around in this body. This body goes back to the dust. But the soul and spirit goes back to the Lord who gave it. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and chapter 6. He created man in his image. Then he created Eve. He ordained marriage. He put in a beautiful garden. He told him to till it. Light work. And he told them to keep it, protect it. Adam was responsible to protect it. And he said, this is the first test of man. The first dispensation was innocent. Each one of these dispensations have a few things in common. First of all, they have a test. The knowledge. God gives them a certain amount of knowledge. And they're tested according to that knowledge. <laughs> now why? Does, does God know what Adam is going to do? Yes! He had already prepared for, for Christ to die for Adam before he even laid the foundation of the earth. He knew what Adam was going to do. It was already covered. Already covered. But he tested man for man. That man would see what? I need God. I just can't make it without him. I'm living in this perfect environment. I have the perfect, most beautiful wife. I have the perfect job. The perfect weather. God had to show him that he needed him. But sometimes man has so much he forgets he needs God. So God starts pulling the rope a little bit. Each test was not for God. God knew what they would do. Every test, Robin, was for man himself. So he placed gardening and the test was this. Will man obey me in these circumstances? And by the way, all seven tests are the same thing. Will man obey me? Will man obey me? Will man obey me? Seven times that's a test. But in different circumstances. Why would he test him, test man in different circumstances? We see it from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Seven different time periods, seven different tests. What did God say? You need to study to show yourself approved unto God. Rightly dividing it. What does he mean, right, with dividing it? Well, I've always heard it said it means handling God's right, word right. Well, it does mean that. But if you go on and check into the Hebrew, what does that mean? And in the Greek, what does that mean? That means to cut it. The same word is used for circumcision. It means to cut it. 
and to divide it in parts. This part goes here, this part goes here, this part goes here. He had seven different time periods, three different races. Three. The Jew, the Gentile, and the church. He tells us that in 1 Corinthians. He said, Jew, Gentile, and church. But at the beginning, there was no Jew. At the beginning, there was no church. At the beginning, they were all Gentiles. There was no Jew until Genesis chapter 12, when he made the divisions and made the nations. But let's not go too far. Let's go back with Adam and Eve. They sinned. They disobeyed God. And we all know it's because they ate the fruit. They were told not to eat the fruit, and they ate the fruit. But who was behind that? Satan. He deceived Eve. And, and Adam willfully sinned. Willfully sinned. Can you imagine how Adam must have felt when he looked at Eve and realized what she had done? <laughs> his bride. His beloved. Kind of makes you think of Jesus, don't it? Taken out of his side. And we've been built from the, from the blood that came from his side. And how it must break his heart when he looks at his bride, his church, and sees the sin. Yes, absolutely. So what happened? God came down, and immediately they were no longer innocent. They were no longer innocent. Now they were guilty. And that started the second time period of man. Conscious, because now they had become, they became conscious that they had disobeyed God. Isn't that simple? First they're innocent, then they disobey God, now they have a conscience. Because before, when they were innocent, there was no conscience. No shame, no guilt, no fear. Why would they? Jesus came, walked in the garden in the cool of day, talked to them, and taught them, shared time with them. They had nothing to fear until they sinned. What did Lucifer do that for? Why did Satan do that? Because he hates God. And he knows that God loves man. And the battle was on now. From 4,000 years back on until Christ came, and then the battle was on for 2,000 more years. We're in the heat of the battle. And what is the prize? Man's soul. That's, who, that's what the prize is. Man's soul. Because God, God loves man so much, and Satan knows there's no way he can hurt God except through his children. You're a mother. <coughs> what hurt you the most? You're a father. What hurt you the most? Your children. That's what can hurt you the most, is your children. Right, Robert? Yep. Yeah. If you want to get at me, go through my children. Right. Same way with God. If you want to get to God, you go through his children. And Satan knows that. He knows that. Adam and Eve were hiding, and Jesus came. Adam! Where are you? Here comes confession. Here I am, Lord. What have you done? Did he know what he had done? Did God know what Adam had done? Well, what, what did Adam, what did God want? He wanted Adam to confess. He was already sorry. He was afraid. He was guilty. He was ashamed. He had tried to cover his own sin and couldn't. So he was hiding. He was brokenhearted because of what he had done. But even at that, and God asked him, what would you do? He said, you know that woman you gave me? <laughs> Why? Because we have to make excuses and it's human nature to blame it on somebody else. And he was blaming it on the woman. <laughs> By the way, God, she is the one you gave me. <laughs> what do we see here? We see human nature, mm -hmm. don't we? Mm -hmm. And it begins right here in the Garden of Eden. It goes all the way through to today, and then all the way through the book of Revelation. But what did God want us to see? There's two or three things he wanted to see just in those stories. He wanted us to see the family was ordained before the church. He wanted us to see that Eve was a type of the church, taken out of the wounded side, and she was the bride of Adam, the first Adam. <laughs> and it's a picture of the church and Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ says we're his bride. We're his bride. 
The church is his bride. I mean, he wants us to see all these beautiful pictures. But what does he want us to see with Adam and Eve? He wants us to see the sin. But then what did God do? They confessed. They repented. He covered their sin. And made them to where they could be in the presence of God. Right. But how did he do that? The innocent had to die. Blood had to be shed. The coats of skin had to be made to cover the sin of man. That was the first type of Christ right there. In the innocent dying because of the sin of man. Why? To make the man presentable before God. They had to be covered in that coats of skin. And then what happened? God wrote a covenant with them. There's eight covenants in your Bible. We're going to go through these one at a time. There's eight covenants in your Bible. The first and the first one was the Edenic covenant. Okay? That's when he placed him in the garden. And he made this covenant with them. They made an agreement. It's agreement between God and man. That's what a covenant is. And, and he said, don't eat of that tree, because if you do, you will surely die. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because once they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, now they knew evil. And were no longer innocent. Now they had a conscience the second time period. But when did they die? Immediately. They died immediately. Because see, we've been programmed to think of death as just being ugh, down. <laughs> There's a spiritual death and a physical death. And death means separation. That's what death means. It means separation. And the moment that they sinned, the moment that they were no longer innocent, they become conscious of sin, and they sinned, they were separated from God because of their sin. Because the Bible says in Isaiah 59, your sin has separated you between you and me. He couldn't look upon. Because Habakkuk says that his eyes are so holy he cannot look upon the sin. He had to make them presentable. And the only way to do that had already been planned in eternity yeah. past. And this would be one of the pictures that he wanted them to see. That one day, the Messiah was going to come. One day, the Savior was going to come. The innocent one, the one who knew no sin, would come. Just like that little animal that I had to kill to cover your sin. Just like that blood that had to be shed. And, and that he will come someday and he will not cover your sin. He will take your sin away. And every time a little animal was sacrificed, it was an act of faith believing that someday he would come and he would die for them. But notice I said it was an act of faith. Because they could kill animals all day long and it wouldn't have done a thing. If it wasn't an act of faith, believing that he was going to come and pay the price, killing that animal would have just been murder. <laughs> see, God had a purpose and he had a plan. He wanted them to see that they were going to sin and that they did fall, but that he had it covered if they would just receive him. How simple can that be? Each one of the time periods that we call dispensations, you say, well, people say that there is no dispensations. That's funny. The word is used in the Bible. Mm -hmm. In fact, he says his, his purpose is to fulfill the dispensations. And when they're fulfilled, then Christ will sit on his throne. We're going to read them all, but I'm not going to read them tonight. He has these time periods. If you think about them as time periods, they were in the garden, innocent. He made a covenant, the Edenic. The covenant in Eden. They broke that covenant. In the covenant, it told them exactly what would happen. It told them what you're not to do, what you are to do. He said, replenish the earth. Have children and replenish the earth. He told them you can eat of all the trees. Don't eat of that one. He told him the consequences. God tells us his word, and he tells us the consequences and the judgment that will happen if we don't obey. Now, it wouldn't have been easier if God would have just looked at Adam and Eve and said, that's okay. I forgive you. It's all right. Let's try again. No. 
God said, if you sin, you will surely die. Now the Bible teaches that they were covered with light. Psalms. So they were covered with light. What was that light? It was the glory of God. It was like the Shekinah glory. It was the glory of God. They were covered with a garment of light. But when they sinned, the light went away. And they could see themselves naked. The glory had departed. The glory had departed. They had broken the covenant that they made with God. So he had to keep his word. If he said, you will surely die, then you have to surely die. Because if he don't keep his word, then he's not a just God. It's just like a parent. You tell your son, don't do that. If you do that, this is what's going to happen to you. Did you ever do that to your son? You probably did that to your daughter. <laughs> don't do that, because if you do, this that's why it always scares me, you know, when you're in the grocery store or something, you hear some woman say, I'm going to break your arm off and beat you over the head with it. <laughs> I'm going to hang you out to dry when I get you home. You know, it's like, you know she's not going to do that because you hope she's not going to do that. <laughs> but you know, if you're a good parent and you tell your children, I don't want you to do this and this is why I don't want you to do it because it's going to hurt you really bad. And if you do this, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spank you, or I'm going to take away your smartphone, or I'm, I'm going to take away your driver's license, or no more TV for you. I mean, you, you give them consequences of their actions. And then they, they go ahead and do it anyway. So what do you do? That's okay, don't worry about it. Then what will they do again? They'll do it again. Because the more they get away with it, Mark's sitting there going, <laughs> and we know he has no children, so he's thinking about himself. No, but it's true. If you don't go ahead and do what you said you're going to do, then they don't believe you anymore. Kind of like the government. They don't believe you anymore. Why do I keep going back there? But it just, here's, this is where we're at. This is where we're at. God had to do exactly, each covenant that he made, he told them, this is what you do, this is what you don't do. And if you do this, this is what's going to happen. It was just like when I used to get down in the face of my son and say, Mary, don't do this. If you do this, mommy's going to spank you. Or mommy's going to put you in the corner. You know? And if he did it, if I didn't carry out what I said, then he would just do it over and over again. The Bible says he's a just God. So if he says he's going to do something... You're going to do it. Okay? He's a just God and a just... So Adam, whenever they would break a covenant, they broke the covenant of Eden, judgment came. Not only did he expel them from the Garden of Eden, but he told Adam, from now on, you're going to have to earn your living by the sweat of your own brow. From now on. Because now I'm going to put thorns and thistles and all this stuff. And the ground's going to be hard. You're going to have to plow it and work it. You're going to have to work now by the sweat of your own brow. And he told the woman there's going to be pain in childbirth. Yeah, thanks a lot, Eve. But not only in childbirth, but in raising the children. What did they say to Mary? Mm. That the day would come that it would feel like an iron was stuck in her heart as she stood there and watched her son on that cross. The sorrow in motherhood. But then he also spoke to the serpent. Who was that? Satan. He had taken over the body of the serpent. And he told Satan, what? The seed is going to come of woman. You're going to bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your head. Yes. And what did he tell Satan? You're going to crawl on your belly, serpent, and eat dust for the rest of your life. That was the first promise that Jesus was coming. And he had showed in the coats of skin. He had showed the innocent one dying for the guilty one. And he started showing them story after story after story. All those stories are true, but there's a story behind that story that was teaching them something. Think about it. And it's all in perfect order. Look at all the 
the different things, Judges chapter 1 through 3, all the different things God was teaching. And he cast him out. But from then on, the children that was born from Adam, and that'd be all of us, except maybe Ken, all of us, <laughs> would be born with that sin nature that was passed from Adam down. You're a born sinner. <laughs> You're a born sinner. You have that sin nature. It was passed down. It, it caused the fall of all mankind from Adam to the end of time. 7,000 years, we're talking time. Okay. To the end of time. They were cast out of the Garden of Eden and he made a new... He made a new covenant, the covenant of Adam. And he told him this, from now on, in this dispensation of conscience, you're to do what you know is right and abstain from what you know is wrong. Now you've got to remember this. They didn't have this book. But they had a conscience now. How many of you have a conscience? And you know when something's wrong and you know when something's right. Because we have that conscience. And he said, you're going to live according to your conscience. You do all that you know is good, and you abstain from all that you know is evil. And they would live under conscience. Adam and Eve cast out. A new covenant made with them. And he told them that the seed would come. So Adam... We've been looking for, the man has been looking for the seed to come. From Adam to Christ, Christ the seed came. <laughs> but he would show them in one picture after another. In the feast days, he would show them. In all their holidays, he would show them. In every sacrifice, he would show them. He wanted them to know that Jesus was coming. And man had been tested in a perfect environment. Now he's going to be tested according to conscience. Now what would he do according to conscience? You read it in Genesis. Anything evil that came to his mind, he did. There was two families then. There was Cain and Abel. And when, when Eve gave birth to Cain, what did she think? She thought that was the seed that had been promised. She was deceived. The Bible said Cain was of the devil. He tells us that in Jude. What does that mean? That means that his heart was not God's heart. But he knew God. I want you to think about this for just a minute. Because this is what God wants us to see in that story. Yes, he wants us to see that there was a Cain. And that Cain killed his, his brother. But he also wants us to see this. Cain knew God. He talked to him. And God talked to him. He knew God, but he wasn't going to come to God God's way. He was going to try and get to God his own way. Cain said, I'm not giving the blood sacrifice. I'm a farmer. I'll give you the best of my, my fruit and my vegetables, the works of my own hands. But God said, that won't do. It has to be a blood sacrifice. Why did it have to be a blood sacrifice? And it had to be the firstborn. And it had to be the man. Why? Why? Because that was a picture of Christ to come. When Abel would kill the lamb in faith, believing, his sins was covered. And the next year when they would kill the lamb in faith, believing, their sins were covered. But only if they killed it in faith. I want you to think about this. Cain could have went out and got an animal and killed it. Just out of anger. That wouldn't have saved him. That wouldn't have saved him. Do you realize that the people in the Old Testament were saved exactly the way you're saved? By faith, through grace. So there was no grace in the Old Testament. It was all grace. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. It was all grace. There is no salvation without grace. There has to be grace for salvation. Even when he took the Jews out of Egypt, and I love this verse in Exodus where he says, I brought you out on eagles' wings, and I brought you unto myself. The eagles' wings in the Bible always speaks of Grace. And how were they saved? By faith, believing that he was going to come. And how were you saved? By faith, believing that he did come. There's your difference. The separation here is the cross. 
The cross is the separation of time. It was to always be the separation of time. Adam was 4,000 years before Christ. We're 2,000 years after Christ. And then the kingdom will be 3,000 years. And how do you know that, Mama? Through this book. <laughs> Through this book. God set a pattern in the book of Genesis. You know, when he got finished with all that, he said he worked six days. On the seventh day, he rested. He set a pattern of sevens. And the pattern of sevens is all the, way, all the way through your Bible. And in this pattern of sevens, six days man would have to labor. On the seventh day would be a kingdom rest, a Sabbath. Six days. He labored six days, he rested on the seventh. He set up the dispensations the exact same way. There would be seven dispensations. Seven. The seventh one being the kingdom rest. Six thousand years, man would labor. The seventh thousand year, he would rest. And he gives him that pattern all the way through the Bible. Remember in Isaiah, he said, I reveal the end from the beginning. He set up patterns. Six thousand years. 7,000th year you'd rest. That would be 7,000 years. Seven dispensations. Seven different time periods. Seven different tests. God was going to test man all these seven ways. What does seven mean? Completed. Man would be completely tested through these. He would be tested according to innocence. In a perfect environment, he would be tested according to conscience. That brought about the flood. Each one of these dispensations ended in judgment. Even kingdom ends in judgment. Think of this. Innocence began in the garden. It ended with them being thrown out. Expelled from the garden of Eden. Adam lost it all. He lost dominion. He lost it all. But then God said, I have a plan of salvation. And that red scarlet thread started right there with the first death of the first little innocent animal to cover their sin. And that scarlet thread goes all the way through the Bible. We see it with Cain and Abel. Abel had the scarlet thread. Cain said, I'll do it my way. Even though he believed, he went to hell. Why? Because he wouldn't go the one and only way through the blood. There is no other way. There's no other name. It has to be Jesus Christ and it has to be his way. 4,000 years they looked for him to come and everything they did, every part of their worship, every feast day, even the clothes and the colors that they wore spoke of Jesus coming. It's all about Jesus and it still is. But he wanted them to see it all the way through the Bible and he gave us this Bible. We are really without excuse. Mm -hmm. Because we have all 7,000 years recorded in this book. And if we rightly divide it and take it for exactly what it says, it gives us this big, beautiful picture, the same picture that's in the stars, the same pictures that's in the dispensations, the same pictures that's in the covenant, the same pictures that's in the feast days. The feast days, which are dress rehearsals of coming events. <laughs> Just for a second. I'm not going to teach this now, but just for a second. Look at this. God gave him seven feast days. It's always seven. I declared the end from the beginning. It's always seven. Seven means complete. He also shows us this. In the pattern of sevens, there's six then a pause, and then the seventh. You see it all the way through the book of Revelation? You see it through your Bible. Okay. This is a Bible study. <laughs> it means we really need to get into our Bible and study this. I'm giving you a big picture tonight. We're going to go through it one by one. Because I want you to see how beautifully and how perfect this all fits. It's, he would give six different things. Like Let's, let's look at it in the book of Revelation. He gives six seals. Then a pause, and then the seventh seal. Six trumpets, then a pause, and the seventh trumpet. 
six vials, then a pause, and the seventh. Do you get the picture? He laid that pattern out for us. We see it in the dispensations, because there's six innocents ended in being expelled from the garden. Conscience ended in the flood. Human government end, ended in the Tower of Babel. Promise ended into Israel being taken captive by all the Gentile world powers. The law ended at the cross with the crucifixion of Christ. The church ends with the rapture. But what happens between the church and the kingdom? A pause called the tribulation. You got this? He gives you six. He pauses. He gives you six dispensations. Innocence, conscience, human government, promise, law, and the church. That covers your whole Bible. When we go through those dispensations, it covers your whole Bible. The first four are just in the book of Genesis. The fifth one, law, is from Exodus to Matthew. The church is Acts through the epistles. And then the kingdom is at the end of the seven-year tribulation. He pauses. He gives us these patterns. These patterns is to teach us that God does everything decently in order. And they're keys. They're keys to learning your Bible. If you learn that pattern, you'll see the Bible will open up to you. It'll open up. Six. For instance, in the Old Testament, a Hebrew could have a slave for only six years. On the seventh year, they had to be freed. They could till the land for six years. Mm -hmm. On the seventh year, they couldn't till the land. Right. He had a pattern. He said, I reveal the end from the... He wants you to see that pattern of sevens. They're very, very important that we see that because it, it rightly divides the Word of God. The dispensations divide it. The covenants divide it. And if it's all laid out in perfect order, seven, seven, seven... It opens that picture. Go, wow, God, how awesome you are. And you've given us these beautiful pictures. And how many years has it been? We didn't know this. He opens it up right. He said, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. First, that means what? It's work. And second, it means what? It's a shame if you don't do it. And then he says, rightly dividing it, cutting it into pieces, and putting each piece where it belongs. He gave them all the sevens. He gave them the seven feast days. And we're going to teach this, but not tonight. But he gave them the seven feast days, but you wonder why. Do you realize that the first Passover was in Exodus? Right? The first unleavened bread was in Exodus. The first fruits was when they crossed the Red Sea. The first Pentecost was at Mount Sinai when God came down and gave him the law. That was the first Pentecost. I mean, everything is in perfect order. But look at this. Passover speaks of the death. Unleavened bread, the burial. First fruits, the resurrection. And then 50 days after the first fruits, Pentecost. Now, what, what should the 50 days speak of? All right. Jesus Christ died on the 14th Passover. 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Exactly like it did in the Old Testament. 3 o'clock on the 14th, which was Passover, Jesus died. The blood was applied. Then he was put in the tomb on the 15th, which is unleavened bread. And that's when the unleavened bread was celebrated. Then, first fruits, he rose on the 17th. 17 means victory. Okay? So he arose on the first fruits. Then 50 days later, the Holy Spirit descended upon the earth. You know your New Testament. Jesus rose from the dead. He was the first fruits. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says he's the first fruits of the resurrection. Okay? And then what did he do? He walked the earth for what? 40 days. Right? Then he ascended into heaven, but he told him, wait, for the Holy Spirit is coming. The Comforter is going to come. He's going to teach you all things. He's going to empower you. Wait for the Holy Spirit. 
How long did they wait? Ten days. What's 40 plus 10? Can you see this? Passover was celebrated on the 14th, unleavened bread the 15th, first fruits on the 17th. Pentecost was 50 days later when they got to Mount Sinai. Now, this is what I've been teaching them on Sunday morning. Calvary, the death, happened on the 14th at 3 o'clock. He was put in the tomb at 6 o'clock when unleavened bread began. He arose on the 17th, on Sunday, the 17th. He, he ascended 40 days later. The 50th day, the Holy Spirit came down at Pentecost. 50. Then there was a time span between Pentecost and the trumpets, because Pentecost is called the Feast of Weeks. What does it represent? The church. We had the death, the burial, the resurrection, the descent of the Holy Spirit, the church age, and then trumpets would be what at the end of the church age? The rapture. <laughs> and today is the first day of trumpets. Mm -hmm. And they would blow 100, actually they would blow 99 trumpets. And the hundredth trumpet was called the last trump. And when the last trump in the Bible, the Bible says, at the last trump, we will be raptured. He said, well, are you setting a time and a date? No. But I am setting the feast day. God did. Because look, if the Passover <laughs> happened exactly the same time that God said it would to teach them, Unleavened bread happened exactly at the same time. First fruits happened exactly at the same time. Even to the very day on the 50th day, Pentecost happened. Then the church age. Because what's the difference between salvation in the Old Testament and salvation in the New Testament? Here's a biggie. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came and went. Came and went. On the Pentecost, what did Jesus say before he ascended? I will send you the Comforter. And what does it tell us, tell us in Ephesians? He will seal you until the day of redemption. The church was born on Pentecost. But listen, a few thousand years before that, the law was given on Pentecost. Just to kind of get you into this, listen. When the law was given on the first Pentecost in Exodus, 3,000 people died. When grace was given in the Pentecost in Acts, 3,000 people were saved. <laughs> Do you see the patterns that God sets up? I want to reveal these patterns to you. Some of you may already know them, but I want to reveal them to you. Because, let me tell you, the day of this is about to end. Because people don't want to hear this teaching. They really don't want to hear it. I had a teacher tell me that tonight. How sad she was because she wanted to teach these things and nobody would come to listen. They wouldn't come. Why? They don't learn these hard things. They want you to tell them something's going to make them feel good and help them get through the week. Right. Listen, if you're saved, Jesus lives within you. The Holy Spirit of God dwells within in you to empower you, right. to comfort you, Amen. to strengthen you, and to teach you. And Jesus is coming to rescue you. And if that doesn't comfort you, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> Jesus is coming. And we win. Passover, death, burial, resurrection, the church age, the feast of weeks. At the end of the church age comes the rapture. We go to heaven to be judged, and then we come back with him for the kingdom. It's in perfect order. What do we see here? We see the death, the burial, resurrection, church age, the rapture, the tribulation, and then the kingdom. You have six, a pause, and then the kingdom. We see it all the way through the Bible. Six, pause, seven. Six, pause, seven. But then we have the number eight. Have I lost you yet? You hanging in there? <laughs> you know what eight means? New beginning. New beginning. Yes. There's eight covenants. Eight covenants. The Eden covenant in the Garden of Eden. The covenant he made with Adam. The covenant he made with Noah. The covenant he made with Moses. The covenant about the land and the kingdom and so on. Even the new covenant he made with Israel. Oh no, that's our covenant. Well, no. It's mentioned in the Old Testament and the New Testament. It said that he made it with Israel. 
So, because see, we as the church, we were grafted in. You read that, you got it all in your notes. He said, and I make a new covenant with Israel. And I make a new covenant with Israel. Why? They are the covenant people. And Ephesians tells us that before Jesus Christ, we were strangers and alienated from God, separated from the covenants. But because of Jesus now, we can take part in the covenants. We're partakers of the covenant blessings. But they were made with Israel. God has a pattern. Every pattern is absolutely perfect through your numbers because every number has a meaning. I've given you a page of numbers. Every number has a meaning. Every color has a meaning in the Bible. Every name has a meaning in your Bible. We're going to stop here. It's 30 already. But we're going to go through your Bible. And we're going to teach you these dispensations, these covenants. But we're going to teach you the symbols and the types. Lord willing, I want you to see these beautiful feast days. Eight. The eighth covenant is the new covenant. That we're under it's going to be made with Israel. But tabernacles, and this is something I just learned recently. You know, you can read scriptures over and over and over again. And all of a sudden, the Lord will say, here's a little gem for you. Seven different dress rehearsals of divinely appointed events. That's what these are, the dress rehearsals. Passover was a dress rehearsal for Calvary. Unleavened bread for the barrow, and so on. At the end of Tabernacles, which is the kingdom, if you look in the Leviticus chapter 23, and I think it's around verse 9, it gives us the seven feast days. Then it says, at the end of the Feast of Tabernacles, there is an eighth feast. A one-day event that represents the eternal age. Think of it. After the kingdom comes the eternal age. After the kingdom. God is absolutely perfect in every E-T-E-R <laughs> N-I-T-Y He is absolutely perfect in every one of His patterns. You think about it. There's 12 tribes in Israel. 12 is the number of, of perfect government. There's 12 tribes in Israel. 13 if you count Levi. 14 if you count Joseph. 14 is the number of salvation. There's 12 apostles. 13 if you count Paul. 14 if you count Jesus, Romans chapter... 3, verse 1. All the way through, that's 12, then a 13 special. There's 12 judges. 13, count me. God has a perfect pattern all the way through His Bible. He wants us to see that perfect pattern. There was 12 high priests. 13, counting Caiaphas, who ripped his garment showing that he had passed the priesthood to someone else. And who was standing before him? Jesus Christ. And who was Jesus Christ? The high priest. Twelve, thirteen, and then fourteen. Twelve, thirteen, then fourteen. All the way through the scriptures. If you get this pattern, whenever you read a chapter in your Bible, you're going to say, okay, who is that to? I want the literal meaning. You have to have the literal meaning first. And then you can apply it. But see, you have to be careful how you apply it. Because how many years did we believe that there was going to be a general resurrection? When there's actually a general judgment, when there's actually seven judgments. Two resurrections. How long did we believe that in Matthew 25 when it says one will be taken and the other one will be left, we thought that was a rapture? That's not the rapture. The one taken is the lost one. The one left is the one going into the kingdom. But did we read that? No, we were taught it the other way. But when we read it, we go, whoa, wait a minute. 
That makes more sense. <laughs> because Matthew was written to the Jews and presents Jesus as their king. The only place you find a church in the book of Matthew is in the, the parables in chapter 13. The seven different parables that you can parallel with the seven letters in the book of Revelation to the church. It's absolutely perfect, Ken. Isn't it? Because God does everything perfectly. In order. By number. By game. We're going to get into our notes next week and teach these, this pattern all the way through the scriptures because I want you to tie it together. We're going to go through the stars and tie those constellations in with the Gospels and the story of Christ. We're going to go through the pyramid. Some of you are going to Israel this next year. Ooh. Oh, you may find me in your luggage. <laughs> <laughs> the numbers in the pyramid tell the whole story of Jesus Christ from the missing capstone. Are you going to Egypt too? The missing capstone on the pyramid. If that capstone was there, the point of it would point directly to the coming judge in the constellations. The door that they finally found when they opened it pointed directly to the devil. When the door was opened and they traveled down that, it went into a pit in the center, in the ground. And in that pit, there was an opening like something had come out of that pit and broke out and conquered death. <laughs> and it's in the scriptures. Isaiah chapter 19 says that there is a, a building that sits in the middle of Egypt and on the border of Egypt. And for years people said, how could anything sit in the middle and on the border? Then Egypt is divided into two. And the pyramid sits right in the center, on the border and in the center. And it teaches, through the numbers, the whole story of Jesus Christ. Is God's Word not awesome? What an awesome God we have. And how exciting it is to live in this time period. Some of you are sitting there going, oh. Listen, this was just an appetizer. We're going to get into this a little bit at a time and take you through from Genesis to Revelation. Hang in there. Can we give him one day? <laughs> Two hours a night, 12 nights. That's one day. We can give him one day. Right. God bless you.